Hi everyone, I'm Chris Hernandez and this is the Weekly Report, your look at news from the city of Kansas City, Missouri. On Tuesday, Election Day, Kansas City voters said yes to the new single terminal project at KCI. The next step is for city staff and council to work with Edgemore to complete the agreement. Edgemore is the developer selected to design, build and finance the new terminal. Citizens of Kansas City did exactly what uh, I've grown used to seeing them do, which is to grasp the issue and then support the continued momentum of this city moving forward. Uh, they've made their position crystal clear that we need to build a new single terminal for all the reasons that we've talked about. Uh, eliminating, taking ourselves off the role of being the largest city in the country without a direct flight to Europe that disadvantages our businesses. And by doing those things that are necessary to show people when soon as they step off of an airplane, they're in a unique place called Kansas City, Missouri. We've been asked over these past few years, what does Kansas City want to be when it grows up? And it's clear that it wants to be a city that fixes its problems when it's confronted with them. It is a city that wants to be global in nature. It wants to be a city that uh, is not in flyover country. It is destination country. And so I'm just very grateful to the citizens of this city who see and saw the vision that we did, who came to the polls to emphatically say we agree. And now we have, uh, we have a little work to do, but we're darn happy to do it. Our goal is so that everything is ready so that we can break ground in the fall of 2018. As the mayor said, our goal is to deliver a new terminal to this city by, uh, by the end of 2021. And we think it's an aggressive timeline, but it's doable. Codes enforcement is a very important city service. We provide it to try to help you keep up the quality of life in your neighborhood. Now, removing or rehabbing or even tearing down vacant homes and businesses is a top priority. But what happens when that vacant property becomes a nuisance or even a real danger to the community while it's waiting for its turn to be torn down? Let's take a look at the city's board up process. We board up properties that are open to entry. And the definition of open to entry is when anyone walking down the street can access the interior of a building without forced entry, which simply means there's a door, there's a window, maybe both, that are unlocked, broken, open. At that point, the structure is considered open to entry and it is also considered a nuisance. Under Chapter 48-31, any structure that's open to entry is considered a nuisance and therefore can be abated by the city if the property owner doesn't do so. We always try to contact the property owner prior to us boarding up the property to see if they would do it. If they don't do it within 24 hours, the city will board it up. Anytime there is a fire, usually the structure will need to be boarded. Sometimes the owner has insurance and, and they take care of it. If not, the city will board it up. Other instances would be buildings that are dilapidated, been vacant for quite some time, vagrant activities have occurred in them. There's a lot of stripping of copper and metals out of buildings. Those always end up open to entry. We will board those up as well. In 2016, we did approximately 1,500 board ups. The city deems these open to entry structures an attractive nuisance. They're magnets for children, people who like to explore vacant buildings, and they are very dangerous. Sometimes you can't really tell by just looking at the building where the hazards are inside. We certainly don't want anyone to become injured in these structures, and so that's why we board them up to protect the health and the safety of the public. If you come across a building that's open to entry, please contact the city at 311. Make sure you have the address. 311 will then forward that information to us out of neighborhoods, and we will send out an inspector. And if warranted, we will get that building boarded up.
I think this will be a nice uh, addition to downtown, but we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, and this is an interim step. Thank you for everybody who has waited so patiently. Our city is more livable when we are more connected, and this is just the beginning. This is important symbolism for our city because it shows that bicycling is not just a recreational activity. It is now a legitimate mode of commuting to and from work. You see behind us here on Grand, we've got our first uh, iterative step, I think, towards a, a bigger, bolder vision for bicycling in the region. And so we're thankful to the city for making this huge step and getting this done. Just give everyone a big round of applause. This was a lot of work and, and thank you all for being here today. The Kansas City, Missouri Police Department has a special connection to the West Side Community Action Network Center, and on this day, a caravan of supplies was being loaded up to send to Mexico earthquake victims. The 7.1 magnitude earthquake hit central Mexico, about 75 miles from Mexico City. Officer Chato Villalobos helped to coordinate the effort and explains how the donations came about. This is a project that we've been working on for a while with several partnerships. The, there's local newspaper and radio stations that we work with to get information out to the Latino community, in particular the Spanish speaking, speaking community, community. We have a large population in the Kansas City area. And so they've become over the years a real good partner for us to get information out. And one of the things they communicated with us was they wanted to participate in some kind of a relief effort for the earthquake in uh, in Mexico and a lot of people have families are you know connected down there and so we became a pickup site and we're working with several organizations to have numerous items delivered here we have beds crutches uh, walkers numerous things that uh, people said that they need under uh, diapers um, we collected a numerous buckets, plastic buckets. What they do with those buckets is they turn them into water filtering devices um, so they can get you know, access to water down there. So right now, somebody also was able to purchase and pay for the transportation of all the items we come, and that's what this 18-wheeler uh, uh, is right now. Um, we have numerous volunteers at the West Can Center. They've all shown up today to help get the stuff loaded into this. So that, you know, it's just, everything's very, just comes from a very uh, grassroots efforts here. Just people coming together to help out a, a very dire situation down in Mexico. Helping Mexico earthquake victims is just one of several efforts the CAN Center does to help the surrounding neighborhood. You know, we do numerous things like this throughout here. We do uh, backpack giveaways, we do, you know, we, help, we get together with other partners as well to just, you know, identify, every year we average about 400 kids that end up getting backpacks. And again, that's just a synergy of people coming together. You know, we, a part of our job is what's made us successful in the past is learning that what are the resources already available in these communities, what are the needs of the community, and when we become experts of that, then we could become better partners. Villa Lobos says KCPD's involvement with the West Side Can Center has made a difference. One of my favorite things about the community policing concept is that uh, whenever there's issues of crime in the neighborhood, you know, you become the source of people to either get information or receive information. We've been able to help all the, non all the um, specialized units, you know, whether it be violent crimes or property crimes, because we have access to information because of our partnerships that we developed in the community. So it's very important for us to participate in all the things that happen in the community that are positive, you know, whether it be graduations, youth programs, senior citizen centers, and so that they see us and develop relationships with us and we've developed a trust where it's like, we're here to problem solve issues just to make the quality of life better and what is our role and try to avoid being another obstacle for the community, you know, that they have several systemic issues that they deal with down here that already exist, and, you know, and our leadership on our police department really emphasizes that we don't want to be another problem, we want to be part of the solution, and so we've been able to find creative ways to just, you know, form those partnerships so that we are affecting the quality of life in a positive way, you know, we are reducing crime, 
We are improving community of participation through crime prevention efforts, through you know just engaging, communicating with each other. A lot of times, you know, this community is a, a working community, and they have a lot of pride in their neighborhood. So, you know, it was in a it was this community has never been a lost cause, but they did face a lot of obstacles in dealing with crime and blight to the point where. As soon as we were able to form that relationship with them and other entities in the community, all of us coming together, this community became a very vibrant, thriving community for businesses, for residents. You see, when crime goes down, property value goes up, which, you know, in turn, you know, insurance rates go down. The West Side Can Center has been around since 1994 and was established to address quality of life issues and improve the relationship between neighborhood residents and the police department. Today, the CAN Center houses a code enforcement officer, two police officers, and a neighborhood specialist. I'm Sergeant Matt Fisher. Have a safe week. Served in the military from 92 to 95. Uh, went in because my dad served in the Army and he was in the Vietnam War. He was a combat engineer. Basically, we were on the front line of a war zone type of experience where you would, we clear minefields. It was a delicate type of position. We were right on the front lines, we cleared the lines for tank men and infantry. One of the things that I did when I got out was make sure you know the veterans are recognized. Veterans are important to America and the things that they've done. It's always been a passion of mine to recognize veterans. I knew that Kansas City has always lighted up the skyline with different colors, whether it's for the Royals, the Chiefs. This year, I thought, why can't it be red, white, and blue for veterans. I reached out to a friend at Union Station and asked him, do you think it could happen at Union Station? And so he checked into it and they found out, yes, they'll, they'll make it work and they'll have red, white, and blue. As soon as they, one building gets on, usually another building will get on. So we reached out to uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Scott Wagner. They put a special action in there, encouraged buildings to do that in Kansas City. So I'm really thankful for Kansas City for participating in this initiative. And I would like to see it become an annual tradition. Today we are in Martin City where preparations are underway at the Bailey Brothers Bank building for the holiday lighting ceremony that happens on November 16th and is supported by the Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund. Here to tell us more about it is Nick Lumen. Nick, thank you for taking time to talk to us about the holiday event. Absolutely. And what is your role with the event? I'm a board member with the Martin City Business and Community Association and we're working in conjunction with the Martin City Community Improvement District to bring this holiday lighting event to the community. And how long has the event been happening? The event's been going on since 2014. Uh, it started off with the Cockrell family working together with the Martin City Community Improvement District to bring the holiday lights here. Uh, it started off very small and over the years has grown. We're really expecting uh, upwards of 500 people, not just from Martin City, but from the community, uh, from the Kansas City community as a whole. So how many people are coming from outside of Martin City area, do you think? Yeah, you know, it's been our experience that more than 75% of those people attending come from outside of Martin City proper. And when they come, what will they see? What all is going to happen that evening? We have a lot of fun things that are going on that evening. We're going to have Santa Claus here to mm -hmm. take photos with youngsters, adults, even pets if you bring your pet along. We have a DJ in place that will be playing holiday music. Uh, we also have at the same time the KC Running Company who is hosting their annual uh, Ugly Sweater Contest. So plenty of fun things there. Uh, we have a food truck as well that will be here to provide hot chocolate and coffee, espressos, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So this is a great family event. You can come right after work, right after school. And then I understand that you got new streetscapes. So not only will you be um, showing off your shops and the retail businesses here, but you've got new streetscapes that you'll be able to That's highlight right. as well. So the night of November 16th is not the end of it. You have lots of things that are happening throughout the season as well. That's right. And those events will continue to run all the way up through the new year. And we're here inside the Bailey Brothers Building and Loan, uh, which a neat little story around that. They, uh, the owner loves the, uh, loves the holidays. And so there's some influence there with It's a Wonderful Life. But they, they in conjunction with the Martin City uh, Community Improvement District, brought that first holiday lighting back in 2014. Well, that's exciting. And if people want to know more information about what's happening that evening and throughout the district, how would, where would they go? They can go to martincity.org and find more information there. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about the event, and we're really looking forward to it. Oh, it was my pleasure. The Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund supports local nonprofits that bring cultural, social, educational, and recreational activities to our area. To learn about additional upcoming events, visit kcmo.gov slash ntdf. Well, First Fridays was absolutely swinging at 18th and Vine last week with a fall festival. a very important part of the city and there's a development plan to try to reinvigorate 18th and Vine. I love African American art. It's something that I've done for almost 30 years and uh, and I won't, I won't just say just African art, the name of the business is ethnic art, so that's, that's a big focus and it covers a lot of territory. I've noticed for the last five or six years, you know, I'd come down to 18th Street and I saw where we're starting to get more and more people. People coming from all over, you know, you see people from Europe, you see people from Africa, you see people from everywhere. 18 OV, we've been open now for a little over four years. Uh, the opportunity of being on H.E. Divine was just, to me, it was like a dream come true because honestly, I can remember doing book reports about 18 Divine in high school. So to be a part of the legacy and, and the history and the district, and again, just, just the culture and the community down here is so rich. It's rich in love, it's rich in support. I really couldn't ask to be in a much better place. More leaves are falling, so the city is providing a second round of curbside leaf and brush pickup for your convenience. It starts November 27th in South Kansas City. Central Zone pickup is December 4th through 8th, and Northland pickup runs December 11th through 15th. The city's leaf and brush drop-off sites are also open. The sites are located at 11660 North Main, 1815 North Choteau Traffic Way, and 10301 Raytown Road. Drop off is free to residents on Saturdays with identification. And for more information about Leaf and Brush, you can always visit kcmo.gov and search Leaf and Brush. That does it for this edition of the Weekly Report. If you'd like to see this edition again or any of our other videos, just go to the city's website and search for Channel 2. That page has a link to our YouTube channel where you can view all of our programs on demand. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Hernandez.